We've talked so far about what data is um, and maybe what a sample would look like, but we really haven't talked about exactly how to collect that sample. Um, and so we have a whole bunch of different sampling techniques that we're going to talk about in this section. And the first one is a simple random sample. Um, and although a lot of these could actually use the acronym SRS, um, this is the one that the book actually gives the acronym to. So in a simple random sample, all it's saying, I'm going to use a darker color here, um, is to say that each member, I'm just going to abbreviate again, of the population, has an equal chance of getting select, uh, selected. So how is this done? This would be through something like a random number generator, uh, names in a hat, you spin a wheel, things like that. So anything that would allow your subjects, your um, members of the sampling frame to be selected equally with an equal probability, um, that is a simple random sample. With the systematic sampling, um, you're not obviously being random with this. Um, so this would be a case where you list out the members of the population. And you're going to choose, whoops, you're going to choose based on a fixed starting point, based on a fixed starting point and interval. So this would be to say, I don't know, starting at the fifth name, and I'm going to choose every tenth name until I've reached enough um, subjects to create a large enough uh, sample. So I'm obviously it's in the name, I'm being systematic with the way I'm selecting the members um, out of my sampling frame to create a sample. Stratified sampling is a little um, bit of a mix of the two. So the population is divided into non-overlapping groups. And that's going to be a key word here, non-overlapping groups. And those groups are called strata, hence stratified. So I'm just going to highlight this because this is going to be critical. A simple random sample is selected from each stratum, which is just the singular of strata. So selected from each stratum. So it looks something like this. Maybe I have the Prout student body and I want to sample the whole student body, but in order to be fair, I'm going to split up my student body. I need some more room here, so maybe I'll move these over here by grade. So I'll look at ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, and 12th grade. And then from there, I'll select maybe 25 students. So I've kind of been fair here, right? I've made sure that every single um, class is represented fairly. Um, and I'm doing this to make sure that I actually get a pretty even representation of my population. Quota sampling is very simple, uh, sorry, similar. It's I guess it's kind of sim uh, simple too. It's a stratified sample, essentially. But on the sample size, or I'll say sample sizes from each stratum, are proportional to their distribution in the population. Proportional to the distribution in the population. So for example, I'll stick with my colors here. For example, suppose our student body is 60% male and 40% female. So this is my population. 
then in order to create a good quota sample, my sample should be approximately the same, as best as I can. So my sample, I should aim to also have approximately 60% males and 40% females. That way, again, in the interest of being fair, um, I make sure my, rep my sample represents the population accurately. If not, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, convenience sampling, I think, is the simplest one of all, and that's just you pick uh, members of the population because they are the easiest for you to get. Um, so I'll say you select members of the population. The book uses the phrase um, most readily available. or easily accessible. So maybe if I'm testing, I don't know, calculators, I just grab the first 10 that come out of the batch. If I'm sampling students, uh, maybe I just grab the first 10 kids that come off the bus. Um, I ask the kids who are in my class, you know, anything I can do um, to create a sample that is just as convenient for me as possible. You might be wondering, well, that's going to cause some problems. Yeah, we're going to talk about that in a minute. And the problems that those run into, or that we can run into, are called bias. So bias is going to be any type of error or distortion present in some kind of a statistical study or calculation. Um, the purpose of creating a sample is to create a faithful and accurate representation of the population, right? That just kind of goes without saying, right? A sample should be an accurate representation of the population. So how do I make sure that happens? And how do I ensure, um, or how do I notice, rather, how do I notice when it's not an accurate sample um, or representation of the population? Well, the first way that this might happen is if there's some sort of exclusion from the sampling frame. So, say that members of the population are excluded from the sampling frame. I'm just going to use SF for sampling frame. So, for example, maybe I want to survey all Americans. but I do it on Facebook. Well, who does this exclude? Well, this is going to exclude non-Facebook users. And, you know, if for some reason I'm able to create an unbiased sample from, non -face from Facebook users, great. Um, but it may not be possible. And depending, of course, on the question, you know, the way they respond, things like that. Um, another type of bias and one that maybe you can't necessarily control is non-response bias. And that's, as the name suggests, is just where um, those surveyed just do not uh, respond. So do not respond. So, again, maybe you survey all Americans. but only New Englanders, or maybe I'll say only Rhode Islanders, respond. Well, that's going to be a problem because as much as we like to think that we're at the center of everything, um, Rhode Islanders do not accurately represent the entirety of the United States. Um, so that is going to bias the survey because my, um, whoops, my results do not faithfully represent what I'm trying to represent. Um, the next type of bias would be something just simple bad design. And again, maybe not your fault. Maybe um, you could have been clearer, right? So we could be talking about unclear, ambiguous, ambiguous, or leading and loaded questions. Um, and again, sometimes you are not being deliberate with these, right? Maybe you just need a proofreader. Um, 
But sometimes you can be deliberate and do this on purpose. And the best example I have of this is called a push pull. Push pulls are not designed to be statistically faithful. Push pulls are designed to sway opinions and they're full of loaded questions. I can't spell opinions. Sway opinions through loaded questions. Um, and you can look no further than if you were to just search, I mean, we're in the middle of an election year, so you're going to see it. Um, and if you search just Trump push poll on Google, um, you're going to get one that is especially bad, um, you know, political affiliations aside. And, um, you know, the loading of the questions are particularly bad here. Um, and maybe if I think of it, I'll put a screenshot of what I'm talking about. Um, but push polls are political devices. They're full of loaded questions. And that is a prime example of bad design. The last one is biased by the respondent. Um, and this is where you want to be careful with the questions you ask. Um, people don't like to be honest if their honesty would be looked at as negative. So let's say people don't like to be honest if it's negative. So these are things like your height, your weight, um, your income, your housing valuation. Things that you might be judged for or you would be afraid to be judged for if you answered a certain way. Um, this is why things like your income, if you're taking an online survey, always has a I prefer not to answer option. Because it's important to recognize the fact that, well, maybe you're not comfortable and instead of pressuring you into giving an answer that you're not comfortable giving, I want to give you a safe way out. So these are, there are more types of bias than this, but these are the four the book covers. These are the four that I think a lot of your examples will fall into um, are these four right here. So well, how do we know if our information is biased and how do we know if we can kind of be sure that the data we're using is, is accurate? Well, data is reliable if you can repeat the collection process and produce similar results. I can do the trial over and over and over again, and I will always get roughly plus or minus the same type of result. Um, data is sufficient if there's enough data available to support your conclusions. Um, if I'm surveying the entire American population, but I only talk to 100 people, that's probably not enough data. Um, there's all kinds of metrics and benchmarks. I've always heard maybe 10%, but I'm also kind of just snowballing and spitballing here. Um, but if you can get about 10% of your population, that is, that's usually okay. Um, but every resource you look at gives you a different number. So I won't, uh, I won't give you a specific guideline otherwise. How do I know if my data is unreliable? Well, there are two factors. It's kind of my last bit here. Um, two factors can cause unreliable data, and the first one is just having data missing. All right, that's obviously bad. This could be due to non-response. Maybe I have made sure I've created a really good, solid sample. Um, it's faithful, it's accurate, it sh it's a carbon copy, but smaller of the population but I just don't have the right kind of responses and maybe only a certain group responded or only a couple people responded, things like that, right? That's not enough information. This would be not sufficient. Um, or for some reason, I'm not able to record the data. That would also be a problem. So if for some reason I can't record the data, so maybe if you want to measure the number of cars on the road, you might have difficulty measuring that constantly. Uh, I'm just not going to try to spell that word. What about at night? What about while you're working? Right, there are going to be instances where you're not able to actually record this information um, and that would skew and um, invalidate your data. The other factor we have 
are errors in handling your data. So we really want to be careful. I mean, the big one obviously is typos. Just be really careful when you're re recording your data. Um, but any sort of outside influence, um, especially on the participant, is going to cause some kind of an error. So maybe you are inadvertently priming them to respond a certain way. Um, you're kind of amping them up or you know, playing with their mood, their emotions. Maybe if it's a survey, you have some kind of technical issue. Things like that are gonna also cause problems and things like that are also going to either give you insufficient or unreliable data. And in either case, you have to be careful.